So this is the second two thirds of the unit. Okay, the first third of the unit is simple harmonic motion, and this is probably two thirds of the unit, waves. All right, so we're going to go over properties of waves uh, today. And what you're going to notice is a lot of the same terminology we use for simple harmonic motion. And the reason for that is that waves are typically caused by a source moving with simple harmonic motion, okay? especially if they're periodic or recurring waves. Um, so we're going to look at the characteristics of transverse and longitudinal waves. Okay, um, those are the two types of waves and they have to do with the direction the wave travels and the movement of the medium it's oscillating. Okay, uh, we need to understand how waves are created and how they are propagated and understand the properties of waves. Properties of waves is the stuff that's gonna seem familiar, things like period and frequency and stuff like that because it carries over from the first part of the unit. Okay, so in space, no one can hear you scream. Why? Because there's nothing to scream if you don't. Exactly. Space is a vacuum. There's no medium to be disturbed. Thus, no sound can be created or propagated. Okay? All waves require a medium in which to travel, light being the exception. Light is able to travel through the vacuum of space, thankfully, um, because of the wave-particle duality nature of light. Okay? Wave is both a particle and, or sorry, light is both a particle and a wave, thus it can travel through the vacuum of space. But nothing else, no other waves. Okay? Waves require a medium in which to travel. Uh, what causes a wave? This is actually a question for what you mentioned before. Okay. So you said that all waves need the medium, yes. right? Yes, exception of light. Yes. Yeah. So what's a heat wave? Uh, heat waves are like disturbances in the air due to thermal energy traveling through it. Heat waves, if we're talking about like, if, like the heat waves you see are not really heat waves, they're distortions in the air because of heat traveling through it. So then how does the heat of the sun, the thermal energy, get to the air? It's a light wave. That causes the heat. We, yeah, the, the light that comes from the sun, there's different wavelengths of light, right? There's the visible light, the spectrum, the visible spectrum that we can see. And then there's thermal, the, the infrared light. So less or longer than red infrared. Okay, so subset of red. That's also a light wave. We just can't see it. Right? There's lots of the light spectrum we can't perceive with our eyes. Um, heat being part of it. Um, radio waves. They're there, they're part of the wave that travel from the sun. Thankfully, we're protected from it. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. So what we see as heat, sorry, I, I misunderstood what you were meaning. I thought you like, you know, when you see the, the waves in the air, that's mostly oh, a distortion yeah. of the air. Sorry. Yeah. Heat waves are a form of light. Infrared waves are a form of light. Okay? So what causes waves? Yeah, a disturbance. Okay. The only reason you hear me right now is because my vocal cords are disturbing the air. Okay. As I talk, my vocal cords vibrate back and forth and they disturb the air and that disturbance travels outwards. Okay. If you're right up here, okay, close to me, the disturbance is more intense than if you're at the back of the room. Because obviously the wave's energy gets less or gets spread out over a greater area so its intensity diminishes. Okay. Same as light. Okay, because like the wave, its intensity diminishes as it occupies more and more space. Okay. Everyone all right with that idea? Okay, so then disturbances cause waves. Then waves are traveling disturbances. Okay, what we see or experience as a wave is the disturbance, the energy caused by the disturbance, traveling away from the disturbance. Okay, the wave carries that energy through a medium. Okay, does that sort of make sense there, everybody? Okay, that's kind of how that works. All right, so waves of traveling disturbance. That's the definition of a wave. It's a traveling disturbance. Okay, 
Okay? It also carries energy from the disturbance. Right? So when um, a, me a meteor hits the Earth, for example, okay, it creates a disturbance in the Earth's crust that can travel as waves that we can experience. Okay? Um, it, uh, there's a shock wave in the air that travels through. Okay? That's all caused by okay, the disturbance. Uh, an earthquake okay, is a disturbance of the Earth's crust. It's waves. It's actually several different kinds of waves that travel away from the disturbance. Okay? Aftershocks are actually the reflection of the waves coming back. Okay? That's why they come here. Okay? Sort of making sense? Weird thing about waves. All right. Uh, so waves require a medium in which to propagate water, air, okay? even solid materials can propagate waves. Okay? Um, in the figure below, the wave created by the motor boat travels across the lake and disturbs the fishermen. Now, the wave travels from where it's created to the fishermen. Does the water travel there? Okay. See a few people shaking their heads no, a few people who are less certain about that answer. Okay. That's the common misconception, especially about water waves. Okay. Because we've been to the ocean and we've seen the water come up on the shore. We've seen tidal waves that come in and you know, engulf cities and things like that. And we picture this idea that when waves move through water, they take the water with them. But they actually don't. Okay? A wave disturbs the water. The water goes up and down. It might circulate a little bit, but mostly it just oscillates up and down. It doesn't move from point A to point B. Okay? The wave moves from point A to point B. The energy travels through the medium from point A to point B, but the actual water doesn't. Now, see, if you were going through this in your head and going, Mr. Pereira, I've seen waves. I've seen water go from here to there on the beach. You're wrong. No, no. Okay? What's happening, and this happens with the tidal wave as well, okay, is the wave energy displaces the water upwards and then runs out of water. And it goes into a new medium, the air. And then the water doesn't have any energy supporting it anymore, so it falls back down. Splash. Here it comes. So in a way, the energy going through the water and like practically displacing the water, it's kind of like when you drop a solid thing into water and the water level goes up, and when you take it out, it goes back down. Yes. See, water is somewhat elastic. Now, a, a, a wind-driven wave is different than an impact wave. Okay? So what we typically experience are wind-driven waves. So the disturbance is actually wind blowing across the surface of the water, which pushes down on the water a bit, but also causes a, a rotational oscillation. Okay? So the water moves a little bit circular, but mostly up and down. Right? And so when we see waves curl, it's kind of that's, that's where that rotational dynamic is coming from. But in actual fact, we're watching a single molecule of water. It's not moving from point A to point B. When a tidal wave comes into the ocean, it's not carrying water from the point where the earthquake happened. But it's traveling through the water. The energy is coming from that point. But the water itself isn't. Now, the greater the amplitude of the wave, the further the water will come in because of how far it's going to come down and become a splash. Now, it's not necessarily a big splash like that. If you're standing on the shore, you've probably also seen the ocean go out, right? Like if you're just watching the waves come up on the Jamaica because I'm a physics nerd and these kind of things, you know, amuse me. That's me. Okay, now it looks like the ocean goes away and then starts coming back. Okay. There's a lot of wave behaviors that go into that 
thing that we experience that sometimes leads us to think that water does weird things. When those waves come in, they change medium from water to air. And anytime you change from one medium to the next, there's some reflection, the boundary. So these waves get to the end and they reflect a little bit. And so that reflection travels back out. And that's why some waves are small and some waves are bigger. When the disturbance goes back and meets a disturbance coming this way, the medium has to take the shape of all the energy it's experiencing, the incoming and the reflected. And so it goes up a little bit. Okay? That's why about every you know, fourth wave or so is a little taller than the rest. It's, it's basically that the frequency and the wavelength have just worked out that, hey, we just happen to meet at the same place at the same time. Up it goes. Okay? And so you get some that are smaller, some that are bigger. Okay? And that's why, that's why we experience this kind of wave motion. big one and it kind of goes back and the terrible camera work by me. And you can actually see, you can see the crests, right? you can see that the actual, like, because it distorts the light a little bit, you can actually see them traveling and you can see them here too at the water level. curl that waves get is because that oscillation is slightly circular. Okay, and there you had a couple that met together so that the displacement was higher and the wave comes further in. Okay, if you're actually standing at the ocean when a tidal wave comes in, it's not a good idea. But if you were, okay, the first thing you would see is actually a bunch of water go and out. Okay? The ocean would actually move away first, and that's partly the polar nature of water. Right? Is that there's that surface tension, there's the hydrogen bonds, so when some of the water starts to get displaced, it pulls water with it to go up. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? And then when the wave passes from the water into air, okay, then it just falls back down. Okay? One of the, I, I couldn't find a video, but one of the best movies that ever showed this was called Deep Impact. Okay? And they actually have people standing on the shore just awaiting their doom because there was nothing they could do and they're watching the wave come in. Okay? And um, as this, you can see this wall of water coming towards them. Okay? And then all of a sudden there's this shock wave. It just kind of comes out of nowhere ahead of the tidal wave. Okay? And that's actually a bunch of the wave energy from the tidal wave leaving the water and entering the air. Okay? It's still carried enough energy going into a new medium that it could like it looked really cool. It's all CG, but okay, it's effectively, effectively correct. Maybe a little bit enhanced for dramatic effect, but essentially the, the right idea. So when you said that the wave doesn't move the water, but then you said that the tidal wave would draw the water back. I said the water isn't going to move from A to B. Oh. It's part of the oscillation, right? Because water is a polar molecule, if a bunch of water gets to place, other water will go with it because of the nature of the hydrogen bonds, the cohesion between the water molecules. So what I'm saying is, the water where the impact happens does not go to the shore. Yeah? It gets displaced downwards a whole bunch and then bounces back up. Right? In the same way, when you just drop a rock in the water, the water oscillates up and down, the waves travel away because of the elastic and polar nature of the water. Right? But eventually it quits. The energy just Okay, so that's, that's the, the thing we have to understand is that a wave is not a bulk flow of water like a river. A river carries water from A to B. Okay, but you can actually track the water, you know, just put a float in it and it will go. Okay, but if you put a float in the water, it generally just goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay, I mean, there might be some cyclic stuff that can slowly bring it towards the shore, okay, but generally it's just going to oscillate up and down. If you, you could try this at home with like a rubber ducky in a bathtub. Okay, and just start making waves at one end of the bathtub. The rubber ducky is not going to move, at least not quickly, to the other end of the tub. It's just going to isolate, it's just going to oscillate up and down as the waves go by. Because the water isn't moving, the waves are moving. Okay. Now, a surfer, because this is usually what comes up, well, how do surfers go into the shore? Well, they actually get on top of the wave and then they ride down the face of it. They convert potential energy into kinetic and they stay on the surface. Okay. Their board is actually going down a ramp made of water. Okay. That's essentially what they're doing. Yeah? 
if you actually watch them when they're paddling out, they just oscillate up and down unless they do badly and then the wave crashes on them. All right. Um, so we're going to look at two different types of waves, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Okay? That has to do with whether the motion of the medium is perpendicular to or parallel to the direction the wave travels. Okay. Most of the waves that we can see and we can visualize are transverse waves. Sound waves are longitudinal. Okay. They go back and forth. Okay. That's why speakers do what they do. Back and forth. Okay. Why string instruments, they oscillate back and forth. And they make longitudinal waves as opposed to transverse waves. All right, so this is a transverse wave. The medium, the slinky, okay, is going, the oscillation is up and down. The wave travels from A to B. Okay, so it's another example of if, if, the, if a wave actually brought material from one place to another, as soon as I made a, a wave in a slinky, the slinky would jump out of my hand and run away. Okay, obviously, it doesn't do that. The wave just displaces the slinky okay, all the way along, and the actual slinky stays put. Okay, that, everyone okay with that kind of visualization? Okay, so we oscillate it up and down, and the wave travels this way. So the medium goes up and down, perpendicular or transverse to the direction of the wave. So in a transverse wave, the oscillation and the direction of travel are perpendicular. So if you had like a medium that was like not at all cohesive, like perfectly uncohesive, it could not propagate a transverse wave? it wouldn't pull up the rest of the medium with it. It still would, but it would oppose the motion much more greatly. For example, transverse waves travel through more dense materials worse. Longitudinal waves are the opposite. Okay, so a transverse wave doesn't travel through the door. Okay, it just like I mean, it, it, if it did, the door would fit, you'd physically see the door do this. Okay, it doesn't do that. But sound can travel through solids very easily. In fact, longitudinal waves travel through solid materials better. Transverse waves are the opposite. So it, it's a bit dependent on the type of wave. Okay, and with earthquakes, earthquakes generate like all kinds of different waves. Some transverse, some longitudinal. Okay, and so they travel at different speeds, basically different patterns, they reflect differently. Okay, um, so I guess in answer to your question, transverse waves and longitudinal waves are affected by the type of medium in which they travel. Yeah? Uh, and again, light is the exception to everything. Okay, uh, so again, a wave is, tra is a traveling disturbance, and in a transverse wave like the one above, the wave is traveling from left to right, but the disturbance is moving up and down, perpendicular or transverse to the wave motion. Okay, so that's a transverse wave. Okay, so a transverse wave, like I said, one in which the disturbance is perpendicular. Now, new terms. Okay, the terms to do with the structure and properties of waves. Okay. Amplitude is not a new term. Amplitude is still the maximum displacement from equilibrium. It's just now the maximum displacement of the medium from equilibrium. Okay. The positive displacement or upward displacement of a transverse wave is called a crest. The negative or downward displacement is called a trough. Okay, so we have crests and troughs. The distance between any two equal successive points on a wave is called the wavelength. Okay, the wavelength is the length of one oscillation of the medium. All right, so this green line that I drew is one wavelength. It goes from crest to crest. Or trough to trough, or any other two points along the wave. They're always exactly one wavelength apart. Okay? Everybody follow me there? Does the wavelength change though if you lose energy? 
the wavelength will change if the speed changes. Basically, if the medium changes, then both speed and wavelength will change. Frequency never changes. Frequency is controlled by the source. So once a wave is produced, its frequency is fixed. Okay? Other properties. Um, so its frequency is always fixed because if the speed changes, the wavelength changes. That keeps the frequency the same. Frequency just won't change. So if I make red light, it's always going to be red. Okay? If it slows down, its wavelength will get shorter. Okay? And it'll stay red. It's always going to be red. Okay. okay. Um, everybody good with, with that? So crest and trough are new. Okay. Um, wavelength is new. Right? So the wavelength is one, the length in meters of one oscillation of the wave. Okay, I've got a couple of videos here to show you on tsunamis and big waves and things like that, because, yeah, tsunamis are scary. Okay, so why is it, like, in an earthquake, an earthquake can produce a 100 foot, or 30 meter wave. Is the Earth's crust moving 30 meters to produce that wave? No chance. Okay, if that happens, I mean, the Earth would just crack wide open. Okay, um, so it's not doing that. Um, why does it get so tall then? Or how does it get so tall? Um, it's not really about force. It's, I mean, the force is there. The force is the, is, you know, the, the ocean floor pushing up on the, on the water, okay? But if you're out in the deep ocean and a tidal wave goes by, you'd be like, mm -hmm. and it, it, you barely notice it. But as it gets close to shore, it just rears up. It is, okay? The things that affect the properties of a wave, okay, are speed, okay, is, is a big one, and the properties of the medium affect the speed. The speed can affect the wavelength, okay, and so on. So if we change the properties of the medium for water, that can mean temperature, it can mean depth, okay, then we can change the other properties of a wave. So what happens is if this is the shore here, okay, out here, you know, the waves are, are minimal, right? They're only about like this. But once that, you know, that change in depth happens, what happens is that, that little wave, when it gets here, the front of the wave encounters this change in depth before the back of the wave. And that slows the front of the wave down, allows the back of the wave to catch up. Well, water's a fluid. You can't compress it. So when you push the two ends of the wave together, the only place for the water to go is Okay? And that's what makes the amplitude change. Essentially, it's conservation of energy. The wave's speed has decreased, but its energy can't. So it basically turns from kinetic into potential. It pushes the wave's amplitude higher, okay? and then as a result, the wave gets taller as it approaches the shore. It gets taller because it's slowed down, okay? and, and the wavelength decreases with the decreased speed. Okay? But the energy of the wave remains. Other one I'm going to show you on science of big waves. This is like surf, surfer science. Okay, so if you get on top of one of these waves, okay, then you start riding down the face and you pick up some speed and then you turn and you can actually ride the disturbance as it starts coming up. Okay, and that's why you can see these guys that go like all the way down there inside the curl of the wave. Okay? It's because they're basically just now allowing themselves to be pushed along. They've gained enough speed that they can move at the same speed as the wave, okay? and they're basically just riding it along. Okay? And then if you're not careful and you don't pick up enough speed, the wave crashes down on top of you. Okay? You gotta kind of get down and get out okay? before that curling, crashing part starts. Okay? All right, so does that make sense how they get shorter? The approach to shore? Okay. Okay, now, a longitudinal wave, okay, is a series of compressions and rarefactions. In a longitudinal wave, the direction of vibration is back and forth, and it's parallel to the direction the wave is going, okay? So in this longitudinal wave, if I have a slinky, and I just push it and pull it back and forth, I get little areas where the spring gets really close together and areas where it gets really stretched. That's one complete cycle of the wave, and it'll travel away from me, okay? So it's parallel to the direction of the disturbance. So that's longitudinal, okay? 
Are we all right with that? Okay, so sound waves are longitudinal waves. Okay, or pressure waves in the, in the air. What is the frequency of a sound wave? How do we perceive that? What do we perceive the frequency of a sound wave as? Pitch. Pitch. Okay, so the frequency of a wave is pitch. High frequency, high pitch. Low frequency, deep bass. Right? That's why if you actually watch a subwoofer, okay, you can actually see the subwoofer move. Okay? That's a low enough frequency sound that we can actually see the speaker going back and forth as it makes the sound. Okay? A tweeter, okay, one that makes the, the high frequency stuff, you can just see it kind of as a blur okay, because it's moving so fast. Right. But a subwoofer deals with frequencies that are uh, at least below 100, if not below 60 decibels. Okay? It's more about the sound you feel almost as opposed to hear. Okay? Anything below 20 hertz, we don't really hear it. We feel it instead. Okay? 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz is the area of, of our typical hearing range. Okay, some people can hear higher than that, some people can hear lower than that, some people have a narrower range. As you age, typically that range gets narrower. Okay? That's why people in there, you know, that are elderly need hearing aids. They've gotten to the point where their hearing range has gotten narrow enough that some of the frequencies of sound we use for language are now kind of beyond their ability to hear well, and so they need hearing aids to amplify those parts of the sound. Okay? So hearing aids don't amplify everything. Okay. Hearing, modern hearing aids actually know what you can program them. These are the frequencies this person doesn't hear, and they'll amplify those frequencies. Okay. And that helps that person to hear those frequencies that they can't otherwise hear better. Okay. So, make some sense? Okay. What is the amplitude? How, what do we perceive as that? Amplitude of a sound wave. That's the volume. Okay. The amount that the wave goes back and forth is the amplitude, okay? And so the louder the sound, the more your eardrum moves. Not how fast it moves, how far it moves, okay? High frequency, low frequency, frequency doesn't matter for what's gonna hurt your eardrum, okay? And it causes it to rupture, okay? It's amplitude, it's how far it has to go. Certainly, moving really, really fast and really, really far is, is bad, but typically what, what will break your eardrum is actually a very low frequency, large compression, okay? And that can happen when somebody like smacks you in the ear even sometimes, like that can actually cause your eardrum to rupture because you get this massive increase in pressure because the hand seals over the ear, okay? And that pressure goes in and tears the eardrum, okay? Or if you're, you know, next to, uh, you know, an ex like a, an explosion, even like a gunshot really, really close to the ear, okay? Um, that can be bad for your hearing. Um, Sometimes at like the Flames game, like when they score, which you know, the other day wasn't very much, okay? Um, but when they do, uh, and that they put the horn on and the fire comes out, like the saddle dome, okay? Uh, that can be over 100 decibels, okay? Sometimes even closer to 110 decibels. And that's why when you come home, your ears are ringing, okay? Your ears are ringing because your eardrum is moving back and forth really far, okay? Farther than it really should, okay? Um, and what's essentially going on is because your eardrum has moved so far and not torn, it's attached to those little bones, the three little bones in your ear, right? The hammer and the anvil and the stirrup, okay? Um, so it's attached to those bones and those bones have to vibrate as the eardrum moves. And just like any other place where two bones are attached in your body, it's a joint and there's ligaments and tendons. Quick question. How long does it take to Depends how close you are. At close range, you're probably looking at 130, enough to shatter your eardrum for sure. Yeah. Um, so any place where you've got two bones that meet is a joint and they're connected by tendons and ligaments. And those joints in your ear are like any other joint in your body. If you make them move too far, what do we call it? You make your ankle move too far and it goes over like this. What did you do to your ankle? Okay, it starts with S. Spraining. Yeah, what happens to your ankle when you sprain? It swells, yeah, it swells and it hurts, okay? Well, when you do that to the little bones inside your ear, you get swelling, okay? So you get some fluid around those, those bones and that makes them move when they shouldn't, okay? So you move your head a little bit or whatever and you get the ring, okay? Because they're swollen. And so they're sending a message to your brain that there's this sound 
that isn't there. Okay? It's the ringing in your ears. It's the same as the pain you feel, the inflammation you feel in your wrist or your ankle or your shoulder when you sprain it. It's the same idea. And if you keep doing that, what happens to that joint? If you keep spraining your ankle, keep you know, dislocating your shoulder, keep spraining your wrist, it gets weaker. Yeah. And you get scar tissue. Okay? And scar tissue will start to limit the mobility of the joint. Okay? That's what happens in the inner ear. You start getting scar tissue forming around those little bones, and they don't vibrate as well okay? when the sound hits and your range of hearing begins to narrow at both ends. Okay? They don't move enough to get the low frequency stuff, they don't move enough to get the really high frequency stuff, and the range of hearing narrows. Okay? That's what causes hearing loss. It's basically scar tissue forming around those bones. And it's not like a wrist or an ankle or a knee where they can just go in and do a scope. Right? And then clean out the scar tissue. Anyone have that done? It's really cool. I was actually awake for my last one. It's so cool. Okay? The first one I had, they knocked me out. And the second one, I'm like, I'd like to be awake for this. I'd like to watch. I know that's not true. Some people actually want to see what it's like. Okay? And they just go in and they grind. There's literally like a grinder. Okay? And they drill three holes, cut three holes in your knee. Okay? One's for the camera so they can see what they're doing. One's for water. And one's for the grinder. And they just keep injecting water and they grind all the scar tissue down. Okay? Um, but they can't do that in your ear. And these bones are tiny. Okay? So that scar tissue just builds up and there's nothing you can do about it. Your hearing just naturally decreases. That's why they've actually instituted as a software thing on your phone that you're, at least if you're using the headphones that come with your phone, they can't exceed a certain range of decibels. But you ever notice sometimes when you take them out, you kind of get that feeling, you know, like there's almost like a pressure on your ears that's kind of released when you take them out? They, that means that they've been too loud, okay? And you've been, you know, doing some damage to your hearing. Anything over 90 decibels is starting to cause permanent hearing loss, okay? 90 decibels is actually not that loud, okay? But anything over 90 decibels is starting to cause permanent hearing damage, okay? So if you go, like if you go to a concert, like this this was like the bane of like uh, musicians' existences back before, like let's say the 90s, definitely the 2000s, okay? They often got uh, tinnitus or tinnitus, okay? The ringing, constant ringing in their ears and hearing loss because they're always at a concert where it was so loud. Now, whenever they're performing, they've got those things that go right in their ear, okay? And they play like this so they can hear the music. It's, you know, they have to do that obviously to be able to play, but it protects them from the huge volume and amplitude of waves so that they don't lose, it protects their hearing, okay? You always see the, the people at the airport, right, that are you know, doing the air traffic, like the directing the traffic on the runway, they've got those big noise-canceling headphones. Okay? Noise canceling headphones actually use the properties of waves to destroy the waves or cancel them out before they encounter your ears. It can't protect you that way. All right, so it's something to be certainly mindful of. It doesn't take much to get to 90. Okay? Like your, your stock Apple headphones for your iPhone or you know whatever, they can easily get to 85, 90, okay? uh, into that range. And if you get the aftermarket ones, you can go higher than that. Okay? Uh, so you have to be mindful of that. Use them responsibly. You'll want to hear your children laugh. When they get older and start talking back, then you can use your ears. <laughs> uh, just what's the range of, like, what's the maximum amount of decibels before your eardrums like, rupture? 120 will probably rupture it. 130 is instant perforation. Your eardrum ruptures, it tears. It's done. And when your eardrum tears, the little bones connected to it are you basically will be legally deaf in that ear. You might be able to regain some hearing. The scar tissue will form over the eardrum, and, and it'll be there, but you'll never hear right out of that ear again. Uh, even with uh, the phone with the hearing aids? Yeah, I mean, you can get a hearing aid after, but I mean, if, if there's, most of the time hearing aids are there to help a small defect or a small um, mechanical problem, like maybe a slight deformation of the bones, and that can be genetic, it can, you know, lots of things can cause that. But if you've had a major mechanical, like, damage to the ear, it's not likely that hearing aids are gonna help that very much. So, I forgot my question. 
I always find that the, the that there's a relationship between the importance of the question and the likelihood to forget it. And it's always that it's a very important question. That's what you forget. The simple question is you can never forget them. So we'll come back to it. Okay? So it's something to certainly be mindful for, right? You guys wear headphones a lot, okay? Way more than any generation before you. How does like an ear infection affect your ear? Ear infection causes inflammation, right? Just like anything else. If you get anything gets infected, it gets inflamed. If you get a cut in your finger and it gets infected, it swells. Well, same thing in your ear. So if you get an infection in your ear, the, the swelling around that infection, the immune response that can affect your hearing, can affect your balance, and all of the stuff that goes on in the middle ear. Right? If you get an ear infection, almost one of the first symptoms is you've got pain in the ear and loss of balance. Okay. Did anyone ever get tubes in their ears when they were a kid? Yeah. Um, and that's usually the result. You get a lot of ear infections is because there's something, the way your eustachian tube works, the one that equalizes pressure, goes to your throat from the middle ear. Okay? Um, they just put a little tiny tube in that to hold it open and help it to drain. Okay? Because uh, if you don't do that, if you get a lot of infections or you don't get proper drainage, it can actually affect your hearing long term. So they okay? well, sometimes put little tubes. They don't do it as much as they used to. Uh, my son got tubes in his ears. I know it's more of a biology question, but why do we like why do our bodies like swell things? Um, well, getting fluid usually around something helps to isolate it a bit and helps you know diffusion and stuff like that to occur more quickly. Uh, it's just a natural immune response. It's got to serve some useful protective function. Or it wouldn't happen. Yeah. So what's like the like when you yawn? What's like the rumbling kind of thing that happens? It's pressure. Yeah. So, like, if you're coming, if you're in a plane and your ears pop, you know, or you're going down a hill and your ears pop, it's, again, it's the pressure difference. So, the air pressure outside is either getting greater or lesser than inside. And so, if you swallow the chew gum, you move those eustachian tubes a bit, and they'll allow the pressure to change and that's popping. Okay. Um, that's what causes the pop. So, yeah, when you yawn, those kind of, those might close off a little bit, and you've got the muscles there that are involved. Like, you can even kind of make that rumbling a little bit if you just kind of rub the muscles around your ear. Kind of get a similar thing. Okay? It's, it's any that tension in the muscles around, there's change in pressure can all cause. Right? Even just putting you know, putting your hand on your ear and pushing, you can, you can almost hear it's a similar thing to that. Right? Okay, that's good. That's got lots of good questions. There's usually good Okay, so a longitudinal wave, uh, the alternating disturbances of compression and rarefaction, that's the, the lengthening part, okay, um, are travel parallel. So you can see in this slinky here, this is the area of compression, this is the area of rarefaction, okay, or stretching, okay. Same here, if we're marking one spot on the slinky, okay, this slinky will move forward and then it will move backwards. Here's the compression, okay, the compression is right here, the compression is moving through the slinky, but that one particular ring on the slinky just goes forward and backward. And, and that's it, it just oscillates back. Okay, um, so simple harmonic motion still applies. Okay, periodic waves are an example of simple harmonic motion or are caused by simple harmonic motion. Okay, and so um, if we've got something oscillating back and forth, causing the wave, okay, then we'll get the wave pattern. Okay, remember this is our amplitude, the maximum distance in either direction, the length of one cycle is the wavelength, and the time it takes one wave to go by will still be called period. Number of waves that go by per second, frequency. Okay, so all those terms are carrying over. Okay. Um, so amplitude, like we said, maximum excursion, right? So we've talked about all of that stuff already. Those are just the, the terms that are going to come up a lot here in the next little while. Okay, wavelength, okay, like we said there. All right, um, right, and the period, okay, is just the time for one complete cycle of the wave to pass. Okay, so kind of an analogy here can be kind of like a train going by. Okay, so if each car represents a wave, okay, because we often call a series of waves a wave train. Okay, so one car would be one cycle of the wave. The number of cars that go by every second would be the frequency. How long it takes one car to go by would be the period. Okay, the length of one car would be the wave length. 
Okay? Um, and that can all relate to the speed. Okay? If I change the speed, then I'm going to change the wavelength. Okay? The wavelength will decrease, but the same number of cars will go by every second. Okay? Not on a train. That's where the analogy breaks down. Okay? But here's, here's an example of it. This happens always. So just north of Okotoks here, the speed limit inexplicably changes from 100 to 80. Actually, 60 now, because we move down here. So straight to 60 now. Okay? Um, yeah, just north of the lights. It goes from 100 to 60. Okay? So here's the mark where, this, where it goes from 100 to 60. So if I'm observing out here, okay, I'll see three cars. Okay? And they're supposed to be the same distance apart. They're okay? If I'm standing right here, let's say I see three cars go by every second. They're moving at 100 kilometers an hour out there. Okay? Three cars go by every second. Well, if I'm standing over here, three cars go by every second, even though they're going slower. Why? How is that possible? They're going 60 there and 100 there. How can still three go by every second? Exactly. Okay. When the speed changed, the wavelength changed, or in this case, the distance between the cars changed. This car encounters the speed change before this one, so he slows down. Car behind, catches up. Car behind, catches up. So here, they're closer together, traveling slower, but still three cars go by every second. Okay. I mean, you guys have learned that. You probably have your driving license. You're taking at least some of it. You have to increase your following distance as you get. Okay, that's what's going on there. Okay, so just like waves, that happens there. Okay, so waves are an example of simple harmonic motion because they repeat over and over and over again. Okay, if I have something moving with simple harmonic motion, it will make a wave pattern. I'll show you. 